Well, hey there, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for our virtual worship service from Heritage Church today. If you're one of our regular attenders, we are thrilled that we get to share this time with you. And if you're one of our guests today, I want you to know that we're honored that you would spend this time today with us. Now, today we are only three Sundays away from the restart of our in-person worship services here on our campus in Fort Worth. And I am so looking forward to seeing all of you who will be able and comfortable to join us on March 28th as we enter into a brand new season in the life of our church. But I also want to take an opportunity to assure those of you who aren't quite ready to gather in person again that we will continue to stream and replay video of our services online so that you can join us from home or wherever you happen to be on Sundays. Now today, today we're continuing our series of messages that's called The Me God Can See. And this series is about the identity and the characteristics that God sees in you and in me. And of course, God can see more than we can see because God has a completely different perspective. You know what that feels like. If you've ever visited the observation deck of a skyscraper or sat in the upper deck of a pro sports stadium, or even if you've just flown on an airplane, you can remember the drastic change in perspective that you get when you're looking down from that kind of height or altitude. You can see things you've never noticed before. You can spot details that you simply can't detect when you're at ground level. And you can see things that are farther away and you can see how two things far apart from each other might eventually collide or come close. Perspective gives you the opportunity to see accidents before they happen and maybe even to avoid trouble. Perspective in your life can help you see problems before they happen. And sometimes, sometimes in this life, circumstances make it seem like someone with better perspective is putting the right people in the right place at the right time to prevent an accident. Just this week, I read a news story about a delivery driver in Vietnam who was parking his car outside an apartment high-rise building when he started to hear screaming from people overhead. And as he looked around to see what the commotion was about, he saw a terrifying sight 165 feet above him, there was a three-year-old little girl who had climbed through the railing of her family's balcony and she was dangling precariously from a 12th story ledge. Now this delivery driver, Mr. Nguyen, sprang into action and positioned himself as best he could underneath that child in case the unthinkable happened. And it wasn't long before that child did fall. But amazingly, Mr. Nguyen was right there and was able somehow to catch that little girl. He got there just in time and he's being hailed as a hero because the little girl sustained only minor injuries from a fall that might otherwise have claimed her life. This guy was at just the right place at just the right time to save somebody's life. And you know, it would be incredible if we could know exactly where to show up and exactly what to do to prevent tragedies from happening. If you could have the perspective to see what was coming. For example, if you knew when the next plane crash was going to happen or when the next major earthquake was going to occur, you could intervene and save a lot of lives. You'd be like a real life superhero. But I don't feel particularly super powered. And I figure you probably don't either. We can't see into the future. We don't have God's perspective. In fact, most of us feel like we've got our hands full most of the time with the things that we can see and the perspective we do have. But I'm convinced, I'm convinced that God can use overwhelmed, ordinary people to do important things and make a big difference. And we're going to look at a story today that's recorded in Scripture, and this story demonstrates some of how that can happen. But before we get there, before we open up the scripture, there's a bigger question 
that I'm going to ask you to be thinking about. It's a question I know you've probably already wondered about yourself. And it's the question of how does a person discern God's will for their life? You see, everyone who decides to put God in charge of their life wants to know how to do God's will. And as a pastor, I hear this question all the time, though it comes in different forms. Usually, though, it's in the, in the face of a big decision that somebody needs to make. Whether someone's trying to choose a college or a home or a job or a spouse, I've heard lots of people wonder out loud, how do I know what God wants me to do or what God wants me to choose in this situation? Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in a conversation with a young man who has his heart set on dating a specific young lady, and he's trying so hard to follow God. And so he was asking me, do you think God wants this to happen? How will I know if God wants me to be with this person? And that's such a natural thing to wonder, because when we want to do right, we sometimes imagine that maybe there's this unseen path that we're supposed to be following. And that theory, that concept, leads us to worry about the possibility of going down the wrong path or heading in the wrong direction. And if you've ever wondered about God's will for your life, and more specifically, how to know if you're following God's will for your life, then today's message is for you. And we're going to take some cues and glean some wisdom from the Old Testament story of Esther, from the book by the very same name. Now, there's a few things you need to know about Esther to understand the setting of this story. You need to know that Esther and her community, they were a dislocated people. Years prior to this story, their people had been exiled and forced to relocate to a foreign kingdom far from home, far from their temple, and far from safety. And so Esther and her people were Jews who were living in Persia, in the area that we would recognize today as Iran. In fact, Esther's ethnic Jewish name was Hadassah, and Esther was her Persian name. She and her people were a vulnerable ethnic minority living in the capital city of the strongest kingdom of their time. And the book of Esther, which tells her story, is one of only two books in the Bible that don't mention God at all. So it's difficult for us to say anything specific about Esther's faith. We know that 60 years before this Esther story, King Cyrus of Persia had given the Jews permission to go back home. And so the fact that Esther's family didn't return to Israel adds to the confusion about whether they still had an active faith in God. But this book is not about Esther's faith. This book is about God's faithfulness. And God had long ago promised to be a blessing to the Jewish people. And that's exactly what happens in the story of Esther. Now, this story is detailed, and it would take quite a while to be able to rehash all the details of the entire story. But the very shortened version of the Esther story goes like this. Esther was rounded up and forced into a harem of young women who were being groomed to become one of the Persian king's many wives. And if that process strikes you as creepy and abusive and scarring, I think you're exactly right. It was not easy. Esther was not a person in control of her own destiny. She wasn't free to come and go as she pleased. She became the property of the palace and she did become the king's favorite of his wives and she was elevated to the position of queen of Persia, but her rights and her freedom were still subject to the king's beck and call. She was a possession, not a partner. In fact, the king didn't even know her well enough to be aware that she was Jewish. And so the story takes a compelling turn when Esther and her cousin Mordecai become aware of a plot to exterminate all the Jews in Persia. In fact, by the time Esther and Mordecai learned of the plot, 
An enemy named Haman had already lobbied the king and obtained royal permission to carry this plot out. And so Mordecai sent word to his cousin Esther with instructions that she just had to seek an audience with the king and plead their case so the king would rescind the decree and the Jews might be saved. And that put Esther in a predicament. On the one hand, she was convinced that her family and her people were in grave danger. But on the other hand, she knew that her access to the king was only available by his request and that seeking an audience with the king uninvited was a capital offense in that culture. And when Mordecai heard about her quandary, his reply sent through a messenger became part of the most recognizable portions of the entire book of Esther. He sent word back to Esther saying, don't think for one minute that unlike all the other Jews, you'll come out of this alive simply because you are in the palace. In other words, Mordecai was saying, just because the king doesn't know you're Jewish doesn't mean that that'll stay a secret. That will get out and you'll be affected by this too. And then he goes on saying, in fact, Esther, if you don't speak up at this very important time, relief and rescue will appear for the Jews from another place, but you and your family will die. But who knows? Maybe it was for a moment like this that you came to be part of the royal family. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, but I want you to just notice a couple of things. First, I want you to see what I think is the closest thing in the book of Esther to a statement of faith in God. Mordecai says, Esther, if you don't speak up at this very important time, relief and rescue will appear for the Jews from another place. See, Mordecai was somehow convinced that Esther was not the Jews' only hope. Whether he believed Yahweh was going to save some of the Jews in Persia or not, we can't say for sure. We don't exactly know what Mordecai was thinking with that statement. But he didn't think Esther was their only hope. And the other thing I want you to notice is Mordecai's suggestion that maybe, maybe all the events that have happened to Esther have been leading up to this moment. Because in verse 5 he said, but who knows? Maybe it was for a moment like this that you came to be part of the Persian royal family. Now, originally this text, this book, was written in ancient Hebrew, which had no punctuation at all. But all the major Bible translations put this verse in the form of a question like this. Who knows, Mordecai says. Who really knows what you're supposed to do and what all of this story has been leading up to? And isn't that the big question we're all wrestling with? I mean, when you add up all the circumstances of your life, where you were born, how you were raised, where you went to school, the opportunities you got and the opportunities that passed you by. When you think about the decisions you made and the decisions that were made for you and the sum total of all of those choices, do you ever wonder, what is all of that leading me to? What am I supposed to be doing? What is my purpose or my call? What is God's will for my life? For example, you might be dating or engaged or even married and wrestling with the question, have I chosen the right person? You might be making decisions about a career or a college major, or maybe you're already in a job and you're wondering to yourself, am I doing what I'm really supposed to be doing? Am I doing what God wants me to do? There are a thousand different circumstances that could make you wonder if you're on the right track and if the step you're considering is the next right step in the master plan of your life. 
And oh, I wish, I wish that the book of Esther or any other book in the Bible would give you a detailed map or a guide to figure that question out. But the closest thing to a guide that we get from the book of Esther is a question we already knew. And the question is, who knows? Who knows? But you know, I think that is a clue. In fact, I think it's a big clue that you and I could use in our own process of discernment. Because Mordecai's rhetorical question, who knows, is a reminder that we are limited, finite creatures. We don't know it all. We can't know it all. We can't understand all of the implications of our choices, the causes of our circumstances, or the effects of our decisions. We don't have the kind of perspective to be able to see and know all of that. God is the only one with that kind of perspective. But the good news is that when God looks at you and when God looks at me, God knows our limitations. God recognizes our limited perspective. God understands our vulnerability and our frailty, our scars and our wounds. And God's not asking us to predict the future or to read his mind. But what God is asking us to do is to do the next thing we know to be right and to trust him with the results. And so the way this played out in the Esther story is that Esther decided to act on behalf of others. She risked rejection and punishment from the king by seeking an audience with the king. And in the end, the king saw things her way and arranged for the Jews to be protected and for their enemies to be punished. The Jews were saved, and this story is included in our Bible because God's people have always believed that God made it happen. But understand, if God wanted to save the Jews, Esther wasn't the only way he could do that. In fact, we have to be clear here that Esther didn't save the Jews. What happened in this story was that God saved the Jews and used Esther to get it done. And so for the last 2,400 years or so since this story happened, the Jews have commemorated this historical event through the festival of Purim. But the Jews don't celebrate Purim because Esther did the right thing. They celebrate because God acted faithfully. And Esther did a selfless thing, a courageous thing, to be part of what God was doing. And I think that's exactly what God is asking of you. You know, in the history of God's interaction with humanity, there have been some moments when God's will and instructions were very clear, crystal clear. There were some burning bush moments and some angelic manifestations when God was explicit about his intentions. But those moments, those have been the exception not the rule. And the history of the church, back to its very earliest days, is full of episodes when church leaders prayed, pondered together, remembered what Jesus taught them, and then just did what they felt was right, did what they felt was best, trusting that God would bless that effort. And you know what? Time and time again, God has blessed the world and advanced his redemptive mission through people who didn't know what to do next, but who faithfully acted on the best information they had. Which brings us back to you. Because I know you've got decisions to make. You've got choices ahead. And if you're listening to this message, I'll bet it's because you've at least got a passing interest in what God has planned for your life. And I can't tell you who to marry or what major to choose or which job or which house or which school is right for you. But I can tell you this. Jesus told us to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And he said, all the other commands of God are satisfied in those two commands, love God and love your neighbor. And so today I want to invite you to trust that 
and to make that a guiding principle for your life. You don't have to know the details of God's will for your life, and God doesn't expect you to. But if you make your decisions in a good faith effort to love God and love your neighbors, you just can't go wrong. Because loving God and loving your neighbors, well, that is the will of God for your life. And you, right where you are, you're perfectly situated to answer that call. You know, there's been a lot of times in the past I've quoted in my sermons from famous theologians from history, people like Julian of Norwich or Augustine of Hippo or Teresa of Avila. But you can find good theology in a lot of different places. And so today, I want to encourage you with the words of Anna of Arendelle, who said, just do the next right thing. Take a step, step again. It is all that I can to do the next right thing. I won't look too far ahead. It's too much for me to take. But break it down to this next breath, this next step, this next choice is the one that I can make. And so I'll walk through this night stumbling blindly toward the, toward the light and do the next right thing. Friends, that's all God's asking of you today, to do the next right thing, the next loving thing. And so as I wrap up this message, let me encourage you with the words of this blessing. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being right where you are. And Christ, who indwells you by the power of his spirit, wants to do something in and through you. So believe this and go in his grace, his love, and his power. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you have a fantastic week. I hope you'll plan to join me right back here next week, and I hope that I might get to see you in person on March 28th or soon after. I'll see you then.